I'm here in the studio of Phil Drummond in Cessnock and I really want to start off with talking about um, how you became a practicing artist because it was quite an unorthodox sort of... I suppose it was, yes. I, only unorthodox because I wasn't trained or yeah. I didn't do any training. So but there's plenty of other people, that artists that are um, untrained or... Um, so how I became an artist, was that the question? Yeah. Um, kind of by default, I suppose. Uh, it really wasn't an option when I was younger because I grew up in suburban Melbourne or out of suburban Melbourne where art was just ignored and yeah. it was never really an option in terms of that was a choice you could make to do anything creative ultimately because the schooling I had really was just funneling us into, I suppose, little middle management kind of, you know, or into factories, you know, people were being things like boiler makers and, you know, working in warehouses and, you know, kind of, or, or some sort of white collar job would be about as, most you'd, as much as you'd aspire to in the 70s. And I kind of, um, I don't know, I was a fantastic student until I was about 14. And then I don't know whether it was puberty or whether it was what, but all of a sudden I just kind of saw what was going on around me and thought, well, I can't do that. It seemed horrible. Yeah. Um, and again, I went from an A grade student to absolute fail in everything. Um, I wouldn't turn up for school. I was totally rebellious. And looking back on it, I can understand it. But at the time, it was just so depressing, the thought that that was all there was, was to go and get some shitty job in those shitty suburbs um, and live with those shitty people for the rest of my life. So I kind of bailed out at about 15 and went and got a job just in retail in like one of the big department stores to my parents' horror. But, you know, I was a bit like, look, I was just so rebellious that it was like, I'm just going to do things my way and I'm going to live my life my way because there didn't seem any point in doing it any other way. So, you know, of course, once I moved away from home, my parents' place at 16 and kind of moved to inner city Melbourne and actually met really interesting and creative people, it was like a veil lifting. It was like, my God, you know, there are other options and um, there are people out there that maybe think like me and want to do something else with their life. And uh, so, you know, I kind of just gravitated towards people that were doing stuff on a creative level without me even understanding that maybe there was something inherent in me that wanted to be creative as well. Um, and then I kind of, you know, every job that I had, that always kind of put me into the creative side of the job. Yeah. Um, and I would do really well. But again, by the time I was about 18 or 19, I'd been working for about four years I kind of mix, started mixing with these guys that would, had been to art school and, you know, they were a bit older than me and were creative and all of that sort of stuff. So they kind of inspired me to, um, you know, think differently and be creative. And of course, we was making lots of pots, so, you know, it was fun times. And, you know, again, I rebelled against that kind of having a job bit. So I just bailed out of that for a few years mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, just did part time work and had a lot of free time and kind of just did a lot of drawing and painting and messing around again, not thinking that it was going to go anywhere. Um, I traveled overseas when I was about 22 and did a lot of, all right, uh, okay. a lot of, um, a lot of watercolour pictures in in India yeah. and they were very naive but still good you know um, and when I came back from India I moved to Sydney and I started to think okay well I want to paint and you know be an artist I don't know when it really kind of shifted all I did was just start painting 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 all the time and have jobs that would 
pay the rent and give me money to live off, but still give me plenty of free time mm. to actually explore my painting. And I suppose in my head, I'd set this date by the time I'm 30, because in your early 20s, 30 seems like a long way yeah. away. And it seems like that's when you grow up. And I thought, all right, by the time I'm 30, if this art business hasn't taken off, I better start thinking about having a real job. Well, what am I going to do with my life? So, you know, at the time I was painting people's houses as well, which was paying really good money because it was the 80s and everyone was marbling everything and, you know, doing specialty paint finishes, which I trained myself to do. And I would exhibit in various shows and group things and people would like my work and occasionally someone would buy something. And when someone would buy a painting, it was always like, wow, I got all this money as opposed to having to work for three days for the same amount painting someone's fucking walls. So, um, you know, there was a nice little reward in there which appealed to me. Um, so, was, yeah. With the opportunity, was that um, coincidental that it was a, you know, after that point you started to go into your practice more seriously? I'm trying to remember. I, look, I suppose I was just always really kind of, as I said, creative, working and living with creative people. Yeah. Um, again, I just kind of started drawing. I think I'd seen someone doing some drawing somewhere and mm. like, oh, wow, that was great. And it was realist stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so going to India was an opportunity. It wasn't just India, actually. I went right through Southeast Asia. It was like the hippie trail and yeah. ended up in America and stuff like that. But, you know, I had plenty of free time and traveling you know, for the sake of travelling, kind of, you know, going just seeing the sights and things like that starts to get a bit tedious. Yeah. You know, and I was on the road for months on end, so it was a great thing to do. It was better than, you know, um, yeah, just, you know, looking at the sights all the time. So, you know, just, I don't know, you don't overthink these things. When, yeah. when you're young, you just feel like your life's ahead. Of, you've got plenty of time. Yeah. I used to think I had tons of time. Mm. Tons of time to just squander lying on the beach, yeah. putting on suntan oil. I miss those days. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. As, you get, as you get older, you just go, oh my god, fuck, I've only got yeah, this much so time, you know, bad. and look where my career is, it should be up there, and fuck. <laughs> so, you know, but again, when I was younger, I kind of felt like I had plenty of time, and I wasn't going to get married and have kids and all of that sort of stuff. So there was a yeah. whole lot of stuff that, you know, a whole lot of baggage that I knew I wasn't going to have to carry for the rest of my life. Yeah. And um, I don't know, I just wanted to explore other ways of living and thinking and doing things. And it was fraught with danger, apparently. You know, that's what everyone told me, my parents especially, that, you know, if you're going to live like that, be careful, you're going to hit speed humps. Or, well, they didn't say it, but I knew what they were thinking. You know yeah. what I mean? There was certainly no great approval for what I was doing. Yeah. You know, I think one of the things, I read it years ago in a book, I can't remember who the artist was, but the, the line was like, to become an artist, one of the first things you have to do is kill your parents, <laughs> in a metaphor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I had done that when I was about 16, I'd completely rejected what they stood for in their life and you know, mm. all that kind of suburban madness. And it really does help you because otherwise you're going to be bogged down with these expectations of other people's kind of ideas of what you should do and how you should live and you know you really well i really just it's my personality i had to just throw away all of those preconceived ideas and i think traveling through india as a bit of a hippie was great because you were exploring that kind of you know alternative mm. and um that's what it was all about for me when i was younger just to not be funneled into this really narrow uh, kind of life that didn't suit me. So when you got back, uh, you then into your 30s, you were saying you then sort of started to take this... Well, into my 30s, I was rag rolling every house in Mossman yeah. for rich housewives. Yeah. And hard to believe, I know, but I was quite good looking when I was a young kid. So <laughs> I actually, you know, had nice cups of tea and things with ladies yeah, and, yeah. you know, husbands would be off at work and I'd kind of, you know, rag roll their walls and flirt with them and all of that sort of <laughs> stuff. They knew I was gay, so there yeah. was no danger there. Yeah. But, you know, there's nothing like a Mossman housewife to, you know, kind of represent frustration. <laughs> Hubby's off at work all the time to pay for that fucking massive house that they live in and all they've got to do is shop and, you know, meet their girlfriends and all of that. So, you know, I'd come around and be a little breath of fresh air and, and I had great clients, really, you know, interesting people most of the time. Sometimes I had some dickheads, but, you know, 
That's what so you get. So you rag roll and this is like painting finished? Yeah, painting finished. Yeah, I fucking rag roll. In the 80s, I so maybe yeah, you're a bit yeah, young. Yeah. I rag roll probably 300 square kilometres of walls. Uh, yeah. Um, but it was good because you charged more than just a regular painter. Yeah. Um, I never charged enough, but you could. I mean, and again, they were rich clients and, you know, um, it was an interesting little world, you know. I had a mini moke and I'd drive around with all the painting gear in the back and it was all very artsy-fartsy for the, you know, housewives. And, you know, they loved the whole show and I'd give them a show, so. Uh, but it, At that point, were you then, were you uh, actually producing? Yes, I was, I would work for a block. Like if I was doing someone's house, it might take me a month. Yeah. You know, maybe a bit more. And then I could have, I could make enough money to have another month just at home where I had a studio. Mm. And, it, you, know, you know, it was a handicap by not being taught how to paint because I wanted to paint as a realist. Yeah. Um, so it was a handicap, but I just, it's just not in my personality to go and have someone kind of direct me, I know. So I was quite willing to make my own mistakes and the work had a naivety about it and a charm and people still really liked it. So they would buy the work. Um, you still have work from those No, 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 I'm very ruthless. You know, if yeah. something kind of, you know, you go back and look a year later and more. I mean, you know, I did silly things. I did things like make, a, a, you know, you, I read some, I had a book, make egg tempura out of, tempera with you know yeah. powdered pigments and egg yolk and I painted someone it was a commission and I painted someone a picture and then about three years later after a very wet summer the whole thing had turned into this mouldy <laughs> omelette <laughs> and you know she was a bit like oh your painting's all mouldy you know back and front yeah. and uh, so I give it here give it here bleach bleach scrub it all down there you go love beautiful <laughs> I mean, look, you know, it wasn't a lot of money that I'd got and it wasn't a lot of money that she'd paid. Um, but, you know, you, there were plenty of stories like that, you know, hit and miss and, yeah. So, you know, I was kind of steered toward painting things that people would like yeah. because it was kind of no point to just, you know, have a backlog of... Not always, that's not true, because, you know, I kind of knew people would like certain things, but I you just, look, again, I didn't read the market as such. But it was always very encouraging when someone would buy a painting mm. and it kind of, well, okay, that's what people like and all of that. I know it's a commercial hall, but fuck, you know, beats rag rolling walls. Mm.